Welcome to Econ Talk, brought to you by the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. At the end of today's conversation, I'll be reading and responding to listener email. If you have comments or follow-up questions for any of our guests, please email me at roberts, my last name, roberts at gmu.edu and put econ talk in the subject line. My guest today is Skip Sauer, Professor of Economics and Chair of the Walker Department of Economics at Clemson University. He blogs at The Sports Economist, and he's done extensive research on the economics of sports. Today, we're going to talk about the economics of baseball, and in particular, the book Moneyball, Michael Lewis's look at the strategies of the Oakland Athletics. It's been a good and bad week for for the A's. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was good until Saturday. Uh, yeah, they had a bad, little bad stretch. Um, they were swept by the Tigers, but they did win the, the preceding round, which was a big step for them. Well, they they went further than they have been in recent years, and uh, it was a bit of a surprise that uh, they even made it to the playoffs. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, winning one round one against the Twins was a good job, but they ran into a buzzsaw on the Tigers. Uh, well, yeah, we'll see how the Tigers do when this when this podcast comes out, we'll have a lot, little more information. We're taping this right in the middle of the uh, Cardinals-Mets series, uh, right on the edge of the World Series. Uh, the A's seem to do pretty well every year, and in particular, they do very well in the second half of the season. What's their strategy that allows them to do well coming from a relatively small market with relatively a market, it's not a small market, but a market they share with another team? And they don't spend a lot of money relative to some of the more successful teams like the Yankees or the Mets. Uh, wh- what is their strategy? Well, I think their strategy changes over time uh, with with market conditions. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the reduced form answer is they spend their money very well. <laughs> they don't spend much, uh, and they get a lot out of it. And uh, you know, you've got to give credit to a managerial team that can do that. Uh, you know. Um, you know, two out of three years, which is their their record uh, since about 1999. Um, they uh, they have had a couple of down years, but uh, but only one, and then they bounce back and uh, keep taking people by surprise. So, I you know the, their their methods have evolved, uh, but uh, the the early period, uh, uh, you know, starting around 1999 and continuing uh, for about five years after that was. Uh, uh, described quite eloquently in Michael Lewis's book, Moneyball. And in that book, he makes the claim that they focused on some hidden or at least difficult to observe or not so easily uh, noticed aspects of baseball success. What were they? Well, uh, the, the the claim in, in Moneyball uh, was that uh, uh, an underappreciated aspect of offensive productivity was simply the ability to avoid making an out. And if you're going to avoid making an out, you're going to get on base. Uh, so there's a, st- a statistical measure of, uh, of that ability called, called on base percentage, which is uh, uh, you know a focal point of, of the book and a focal point of the work that uh, John Hakes of Albion College and I did in evaluating uh, the claims in Lewis's book. Let's talk about on-base percentage. On-base percentage is just uh, batting average augmented by walks, right, more or less. I mean, there's a few other things in there, hit by pitch. Yeah. But but the the most important thing that on-base percentage takes account of, the batting average doesn't, is the ability to get on base via walk, uh, base on balls. Right, right. And so the the claim of the book is that, that this ability, the ability to draw walks, avoid outs, get on base, and eventually score, ideally being hit in by somebody else, yeah. was underappreciated by baseball uh, managers and general managers uh, until recently. How is that possible? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, but, uh, you know, Hakes and I evaluated the claim that uh, uh, on-base percentage was undervalued in the marketplace and, and you know, the data support that claim, uh, which is a bit surprising. Uh, There's a lot of information out there on the contribution of various offensive skills to winning games. Uh, You know, baseball is a very uh, meticulously and intensively studied subject with tons and tons of statistics. So the information's been out there for a long time. Um, 
the market is one that you you think would be quite competitive as these teams uh, try and crawl over each other to get to the top of the heap. Yet somehow this strategy uh, appears to have been underexploited uh, until the A's came along. Well, actually, I, I'm a skeptic on that competitive part. We'll come back to that later, but let, <laughs> because I think that's a very, very interesting uh, question. But let's stick right now. Let's stick with the this on base percentage. So, in your research, uh, you found that uh, on base percentage was relatively inexpensive. That is, you could acquire a player who looked, you know okay or good on these other dimensions that people knew all the quote knew all about like batting average or home runs right. but this not as as there was a characteristic the ability to draw walks that was undervalued in the marketplace that actually contributed quite a bit to offensive success and and that's what you found correct well i think we we find that uh somewhat indirectly we we don't uh use a measure of getting on base uh by walks explicitly in our statistical analyses, we just use the on-base percentage measure, which incorporates that skill. But what we, we what we find is that um, on-base percentage is relatively undervalued, and by relatively we mean relative to its contribution to winning games, whereas uh, the ability to to slug or hit hit the ball for doubles, triples, and home runs was, was relatively overvalued. And you found that that relationship was not constant. It changed over time, correct? Well, it, it, it changed over time. In the early part of the period where the A's were successful, what we find is that uh, is an on-base percentage was undervalued. And sure enough, the A's were at the top of the league in, in obtaining walks um, uh, each and every year. And by, by at the top, I mean the top one, or two, or three, three teams in they did so uh, uh, amongst most of the other high-paying teams, like the New York Yankees, who were perennially at the top of these lists. Um, so uh, uh, in the early part of the period, it appears that on-base percentage was an underpriced uh, skill or talent. But the last year of the, the period that we study, uh, that uh, anomaly goes away. Uh, um, the offensive skills are valued in the marketplace, according to the data that we have, uh, in a manner which reflects their uh, contribution to winning games, which is, is what you'd expect if the labor market were valuing uh, baseball skills efficiently. And this is one answer, at least, to the puzzle that I had when I read the book for the first time. And it's a, it's a fascinating book. It's very, very well done. Uh, why would Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland Athletics, the Oakland A's, give away these trade secrets. He takes Michael Lewis in. He gives Michael Lewis access to private meetings between himself and his staff and where he's talking about the value of on-base percentage and and other similar measures, by the way. One I want to mention is pitches per bat. Yeah. So the A's put a lot of value on a, on a batter who not only gets on base via walk, yeah. Uh, but pays a lot. They paid a lot of attention to how many pitches they saw. Whether making they, the other side work harder, right? Exactly. Yeah. Whether they swung at the first pitch. But it, there's a puzzle. Why would Billy Bean give up publicly all these trade secrets? One answer was, well, it was worth it because he got to be famous. But of course, yeah. it turns out he drew a lot of hatred. <laughs> from, he made some enemies. Yeah, yeah, from some traditional baseball people. Yeah. Uh, but your explanation is that. It was the value of that those inside. There was no longer inside information. It no was longer inside needed. information. I think the cat was out of the bag. Um, you know, Lewis uh, sensed a very good story in the making, and as you suggest, uh, you know, it was written up in a fascinating way. It's it's a it's a you know one of the most intriguing books I've read in the past few years. Uh, but uh, you know, by the time he was on to it, I think other people were too, and. Um, so it's just a matter of describing it for uh, you know readers and uh, not so much giving out information which uh, uh, would affect the marketplace. Uh, you know, during the year that this book was being written, uh, baseball uh, front office staffs uh, were were looking at the A's. <laughs> How come these guys did it again? Right. Uh, and. And, uh, you know, we're asking that question and becoming interested in the people who made the A's the success that they were. And, and those, you know, were people in the A's front office. 
and uh, you know they went out and hired them. Yeah, some once of those... you hire those people, you know the information is uh, is out there in, in, in public, so to speak, and uh, is going to affect uh, you know the pricing in the market. Yeah, the bidding on free agents then is going to be different. The drafting of of players is going to be different. Right. Uh, and so some of Bean's disciples were hired in, away, and and there were other disciples who were intellectual disciples, people like Theo Epstein of the Red Sox, yep. who was a longtime fan of Bill James, right. who was uh, in some sense the, the the father of this more statistically based approach. Right. Um, yeah, Theo Epstein was the young, I believe, the youngest uh, GM uh, in baseball when he was hired by correct. the Red Sox, and you know the Red Sox were trying to you know pick up a little bit of this magic, and they did. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, and they did it indirectly, not. Uh, through the A's front office, uh, uh, per se. I mean, they 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 tried to hire Billy Bean himself. Yeah, they did. Made him but, a very generous um, offer. You know, took uh, you know Bean's suggestion and went down uh, down the coast of California and picked up Epstein. And the book it, the book contrasts the sort of gearhead, nerdy approach of these statistical yeah. uh, mavens with yep. the wisdom the gut instincts of the old scouts who evaluate a player by looking at him right and uh the scouts are sort of the fall guys in the book they look sort of buffoonish ignoring yeah. these statistical things yeah yeah well you know you, you have a clash of cultures here uh the you know the the kid who's good at uh um uh tweaking uh models and pulling out information from a laptop may not be uh too skilled at evaluating a player in the flesh, uh, and vice versa. And, you know, I think this is a perennial problem when you have uh, different evaluation methods which have very little common ground and, uh, you know, trying to make them work together. And the book, uh, you know, clearly depicts a, a, a clash of cultures, if you will, when uh, the statistical analysis says we should pick this person in the draft and the and the people who look at players in the flesh say, "Huh, you know, I've got this Adonis who, you know, could be a, you know, a, a major talent in the future, and you're going to let him go." So, uh, because he swings at the first pitch, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, you know, I think you know the A's to their their credit, uh, you know, uh, purchased uh, skill uh, of that variety and also tried to develop it within their organization. So, you know, they, they took they took people that uh, you know might be uh trainable and put that ethic into their system down in the min- minor leagues and tried to produce uh these skills uh you know on, on top of just the raw athletic talent. But what they weren't willing to do was overpay for what the scouts could easily uh discern along with all the other scouts in the major leagues in that uh uh, you know, raw raw talent is all that there is. Well, what I love about that insight about data versus you know gut instinct is that you know Bill James wrote about this a long time ago that you can watch a shortstop who looks spectacular in the field, makes these incredible plays, but you can't look at a couple plays and decide whether a person is a successful shortstop. You look at you have to look at how many balls they get to, how many outs they 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 contribute to the defense of the team. And it's just such a nice parallel to so many things in economics where what is seen misleads as to what is fully going on in international trade. You, know, right. you, you see the jobs that are lost. You don't see the jobs that are created often. Right. And uh, it's just a nice parallel to the challenges of, say, evaluating an economy, uh, with right. a piece, only looking at a piece of it or not right. looking at the full data picture. Right. I, I think that's absolutely correct. And, um, in, you know, in the case of the on-base pen, uh, percentage statistic, what's not – directly observed is the fact that the guy didn't do something. The guy who got on base did not make an out. Right. And what was underappreciated was just how critical a scarce resource like an out is to uh, an offensive team that's at bat. You give up one of these outs, and that just kills the probability structure of you scoring runs in an inning. And uh, uh, you know, people began to understand that, I think, when they when they looked at these Sort of run scoring tables and what happened if you went from one out to two outs or zero outs to one out and and how those numbers just fall off the table and uh, you know what uh, the A's did uh, uh, was to examine uh, 
that type of information. And, uh, you know, they got it, and, you know, they took it one step further and built a strategy on it. And then we saw that strategy no longer uh, be viable because of competition from these other uh, teams that, that saw that it that saw its worth. Let, let's talk a little bit about why it took so long, because um, I'm fascinated by that. I'd like to hear your thoughts. The There's an old saying in baseball, a walk's as good as a hit. Yeah. Now, we know it's not exactly right. because a walk can only advance a, a player one base. Right. A hit can often advance a player two bases or right. more. But baseball players have, and baseball coaches from Little League on up have known for a long time that a walk's a good thing. Yep. What would be the argument for why that um, skill, and it is a skill, it's a yeah. skill that consistently yep. uh, works year to year for certain players, why, it, why that skill was undervalued? Well, I don't think I have the answer to that. Uh, you know, I've certainly speculated about it. Well, let's um, hear those speculations. Well, you know, I think that... Uh, uh, that what teams uh, are, are trying to do is, is trying to climb to the top of a heap, the heap and and, uh, and be the best team. And in doing so, um, I think they they select what appear to be in the flesh, you know, uh, really talented players, players that uh, are so good that they're they're better potentially than. Uh, than anyone else at the position and that sort of thing. And um, so that there's an excess emphasis, perhaps, at, uh, at trying to be uh, 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 the order statistic or, you know, the, 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 the top of the distribution at, at uh, any given position. And um, so if, if you do that, you might place excessive weight on a big, fast person who can hit the ball in the gap and, and stretch doubles into triples and, and hit lots of home runs and, and, and so on. And uh, everybody looking for the best person uh, at center field or right field or whatever to do that might might skip over uh, a, a person who could fill in the gap in a team and uh, be be quite productive and move runners along and, uh, uh, you know, you know, make pitchers work and uh, so called uh, little things do the little things and do the unobserved thing. And it, it could be a product of, uh, of uh, staffs uh, in, in a front office and, and, and managers on the field, you know, trying to identify uh, the order statistic or, you know, the, the, the top few um, players at each position and ignore you know, people which are sort of good or in the middle of the distribution uh, uh, in in filling out a solid roster. So that's uh, that's uh, one hypothesis that I've got is sort of behavioral in nature, and that uh, you know teams are interested not in uh, in uh, in say maximizing their winning percentage per se this this year, but in taking a, a chance at at being at the top of, of the table. Well, that wouldn't necessarily be uh, irrational, right? Not and necessarily it, irrational, no. And in, in particular, teams may not be so interested in uh, winning right. the whole thing. They might simply be interested in maximizing their revenue. And that's, if, another, that's another uh, potential explanation. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that my earlier speculation was uh, uh, one which – is actually consistent with a lot of the baseball people's criticism of the Oakland A's. And that is, well, you know, they're just trying to put together a team that's good enough in some sense uh, and not trying to be champions, and it shows when they get to the postseason. And, uh, you know, they've, they've done okay this year in actually winning a series, but during the, the so-called money ball period, uh, the A's failed to win yeah, uh, a, a postseason series. So... Uh, you know that that may in fact be a valid criticism of of the way they put together their roster. It wasn't really put together uh, to dominate in the postseason, quote unquote. Yeah, and I don't buy to, that a hundred percent. Yeah, I don't like that theory. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you know, the reason why I don't buy it is because I believe uh, uh, Billy Bean's statement that the uh, 
the, the postseason, particularly in the, the initial five-game series stage, is a crapshoot. Yeah, there's a lot um, of randomness in that. I mean, witness witness the Yanks. Yeah. Uh, you know, and their failures uh, since when? 2000. Yeah. I don't think they've won a World Series in the 21st century. I just want to get that in. That's, that's important. They that's did win right. one in 2000, but that really isn't. The, that was the 20th century. So right. they're 0 for 6 in this century. Yeah, 0 for 6 in this century. Although they've, they've made it to the big show twice. Yep. Um, but uh, you know, it certainly puts the lie to the uh, the sort of hysteria around 2000 and 2001, which suggested that the Yanks were, you know, <laughs> dominating baseball and were killing the game. Well, you know, they they still spend, you know, what, 80 million more than the next team or something yeah, like this about. and, uh, you know, can't get past the first round. Well, I want to come back to this issue of whether the A's are, quote, good enough or that was their strategy. They weren't so focused on the postseason, et cetera. I, I think the – let me cast your speculation a different way. It's very possible that general managers and owners want flashy players right. uh, who hit home runs and steal bases, right. even though stealing bases is particularly uh, un- not particularly productive in, in producing right. winning, right. Uh, as has been studied by lots of people in the, in the statistical analysis of baseball. But they hire flashy players who, say, hit home runs but strike out a lot or steal bases because the fans enjoy it. Right. And it's true, it, it costs them something in winning, but it puts fans in the seats because they, they're more likely to come, and right. only one team can win every year, so right. you need to be entertaining. Yep. So walks aren't very entertaining, uh, and so one argument would be that it's rational for general managers to undervalue walks because, hey, what's the... Uh, Entertainment just, value yeah. of that. Yeah. The alternative thesis is that they're stupid. Right. Uh, they missed out for 100 years or so. Yep. Um, this um, this incredibly important part of the game and undervalued it simply because they were stuck in their ways. You know, traditionalist front office has always done it this way in the past. Uh, what do you think of that of that theory? Well, I'm loath to adopt uh, stupidity theories. That's not uh, the way I do business. I'm an economist, and we make our living with alternative assumptions. But in the, in this case, I think we've got a horse race uh, between. Uh, you know, a so-called type stupidity theory and uh, a theory in which, you know, it might be entertainment value or the objective might be uh, something other than, you know, uh, you know, maximizing expected winning percentage when you put together a roster at the beginning of the year. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we haven't examined and given credence to the entertainment value theory. Uh, one could do that if, for example, you you looked at uh, attendances and how they evolve over the season for teams that steal lots of bases and have quote exciting uh, offensive strategies to put on display that kind of thing. But you know it hasn't been done yet. And uh, you know what Hakes and I did in our evaluation of the Moneyball hypothesis paper was you know put uh, Lewis's claim to the test that there was mispricing from the point of view of uh, the valuation of skill in the labor market and the contribution of these skills to winning games. I think that's the first order hypothesis to investigate. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was a challenge. Uh, you know, Lewis uh, very clearly in the book makes the claim that uh, the ability to get on base was underpriced. Well, that's a, that's a testable proposition. And, uh, capable of being refuted, and uh, so Hakes and I went about that task, and we found out that the claim holds up to scrutiny. So uh, we know we know that much, I think, at this point. Well, but important. there's a, there's a lot of other uh, questions that uh, that uh, uh, present themselves uh, once we establish that that uh, Lewis's claim was true. Uh, I think there's interesting work to be done in this area. We could evaluate the entertainment value of players uh, with various means and uh, and see if that's a contributing factor to this so-called mispricing. Very well, very well could be, uh, but uh, you know, we'd like to to have a, a good basis for you say latching on to that uh, that explanation. Um, and you know we don't have it yet. 
I, by the way, I used home runs as an example of a flashy skill that might be over overvalued, but a lot of sluggers are undervalued uh, because they do that. They hit the home runs and they walk a lot, but they don't have a high batting average. So someone like right. Mike, someone like Mike Schmidt. Yeah. who is one of the greatest players of all time, I think was underappreciated yeah. because fans and, and so-called pundits and experts complained that that's he's, all he he's does. He's only hitting 240. Right, right. but he, yeah. was, he was getting on base right. 350 and above yeah. and, and probably, I think, probably toward 400 yeah. and uh, was um, had a very healthy slugging percentage, and yeah. so I think he was undervalued. Yeah, he may well have been. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, 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 what... Uh, uh, he got paid during that period, but I'm, you know, as, as a as a fan of the Houston Astros and getting beat by him um, to a pulp, I'm 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 sure that the Astros pitchers just lived in fear whenever he stood in the no, batter's no box. Here's another factor I might talk about: the fan awareness of these effects has changed dramatically, and I, and I say that based on uh, a very simple data point, which is that USA Today and other publications now list on base percentage yeah. among the leaders, which is really yeah. a revolution among yeah. baseball fans. It was never yeah. listed. It was an obscure statistic. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have the net and the web um, in the past. You had to look it up in uh, the baseball encyclopedia. Now it's totally available on the web, and, and it's listed in daily newspapers mm-hmm. as an important factor. I suspect that's put pressure on general managers to pay attention to it. Well, I would think so. Uh, you know, th- this, These ideas are now so out in the mainstream that te- you know the TV analysts talk about talked about this the other night in the A's versus uh, Tigers game when the, uh, one of the Oakland A's swung at the first pitch hmm. in, a, in a situation where you, you did want to make uh, uh, the pitcher work and you know that you know that's a that's a sign that it's become cliche when they start harping on it for for a half inning afterwards so uh, it is out there people do understand it and uh, it, it's got to shape uh, uh, decision-making. I do want to mention that one of the players who's talked about in great detail in Moneyball is Kevin Euclid, Yeah, a player that the Oakland A's coveted and lost to the Red Sox right. uh, in a draft. He did lead the majors this year in pitches per at-bat, yeah. Uh, yeah. which is interesting. You look at his performance, he was a decent leadoff hitter. You wouldn't call him a great leadoff hitter, but I suspect right. the Red Sox were very happy with him. Yeah, you, you you know when you do that, you make your 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 other hitters in your lineup more productive, and uh, so you know he was batting first for for that reason probably. An externality. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I want to get back to this issue of stupidity versus um, uh, some other strategy other than right. maximizing winning percentage. Yeah. People say, and you said earlier, and I. That you know, baseball is very competitive. Uh, I'm going to take a different approach, and let's hear your reaction. I'm going to argue baseball is not competitive, and it looks yep. competitive. Every team's trying to win. Supposedly, they constantly are firing managers because they didn't win, or general managers are turned over. Yep. It's possible that owners actually are playing a very, very different game, yep. which is the costs of not winning are not very high. Yep. Uh, if, if you field a lousy team year in, year out, which mm-hmm. many places do in lots yep. of sports, yep. you can still make a great deal of money. So you can indulge your scouts' uh, stupidity at a very low cost or traditional methods. You can be a racist, which uh, the, most teams in the American League were for a long time, and right. as a result, right. they lost uh, the All-Star game year in, year out in, yep. the, in the 60s yep. when the National League integrated center. I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. It's a huge factor. I, yeah, no one's written about it. I'd love to see somebody write on that. The National yeah. League uh, integrated much quicker. Right. They had all the best sure. stars, right. and they crushed the uh, – the American League in the All Star Game. The American League did well in the World Series in those years because they still, the Yankees were still a dominant team. Yeah. They were a dominant white yeah. team. Mm-hmm. Uh, the African American players were spread out across different National League franchises. Right. right. But the National League was a better league, I think, overall because they integrated quicker. Yeah. Well, and Cleveland moved up the American League ranks for that one brief period, the only period where they had success. Uh, uh, prior to the 90s when they integrated first in the right. American League. That's a great example. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So so one view says that, you know, hey, it looks competitive, but uh, because I'm with you, I find it really disturbing that yeah. this, uh, you know, we believe in competition economics. We don't right. like to say people are stupid. Right. But why didn't – it shouldn't have taken 70 years or whatever you want to call the time frame for this to yeah. come out. Yeah. 
And so an alternative theory is that, well, teams just uh, – they're not punished if they if they do badly. In, in a real business, in a real industry, yeah. there was some technique like, say, uh, data analysis or yeah. marketing that you ignored. You don't just have a mediocre year. You go out of business. Right. It's right. really hard to go out of business if you're a baseball team. No, you, you just collect the check and um... – you know, it, the, it, the the situation is worse in, in pro football, and uh, the uh, the prototypical example of just collecting your check uh, is in the NFL, where most of the revenue comes from the NFL contract, uh, the television contract that they have, and uh, a minor share comes from local revenue. And so, a team team like the Cincinnati Bengals through the 90s was able to you know collect a check without really working too hard. Uh, that incentive is offset in uh, in baseball because local revenues are a much bigger factor. But uh, but, but even still, so, well, even so, even so, uh, you you've got a monopoly on the Kansas City market. Say if you're the Royals, yeah, you've got a yeah. monopoly on the Milwaukee market. Right, if you're and, the Brewers. And, the, and the question is, how bad do you want to win? And the the answer might be not very bad, <laughs> because uh, what it takes to to win in 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 the marketplace by going out and and getting the best talent um, might not be worth the additional revenues that you get in your local market. So uh, you know that's 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 a real concern. I think what uh, what the A's showed was well, <laughs> if everybody's doing this, we can beat them. Um, uh, so that you know that may in fact be what what uh, what was going on that the A said okay we'll put a little uh, Yankee ingenuity no pun intended uh, into the problem uh, and we can still uh, beat these guys with with a relatively low payroll and you know on to the uh, the entertainment value uh, that you suggested earlier they uh, increase their attendances by winning. There's a, there's a right, lot of entertainment in winning. Yep, that's true. And uh, they they uh, they got uh, more people to come out to the park and were able to charge more for tickets when they put their run of success together. This issue of competitiveness, how hard is it to um, change owners in, in these franchises? Let's say you're, um, you're uh, Bill Bidwell. Is yep. it Bill Bidwell? Yep. Arizona Cardinal owner, yep. Yep. Uh, who's really uh, disliked by a lot of St. Louisans for what he did to the St. Louis Cardinals. He took his team to Arizona, got a great stadium deal, and I think's doing a similarly bad job there. And got a great stadium deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and you see lots of owners in, in baseball who are not as aggressive as, say, George Steinbrenner, yep. not as eager to win at all, happy to field a so-called competitive team. In, in another business, different industry, uh, if the owner of the business does badly, does a, 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 a poor job, competition drives them out. Right. How hard is it to take control of a baseball team from a horrible owner? Well, the owner's got to be willing to sell. Um, and you know, the example that you bring up uh, with Bid, Bidwell is one where you know this guy is uh, is uh, you know happy with his team and <laughs> doesn't want to sell it. So. Uh, but presumably he could be outbid. I understand he, quote, generally doesn't want to sell it. He's in an exclusive club that right. has an immense amount of non-monetary right. uh, benefits for right. him in terms of handing out goodies, box, you know, yep. luxury box seats to his friends, and, and right. people pay attention to him, which they wouldn't. He gets in the paper, right. et cetera. Right. But let's say somebody outbid him by a large amount and made it attractive for him to leave. Can he just accept that bid? I don't think he can. Well, yeah, it has to be approved um, right. by the club. Uh, I don't think approval by the club is is the big constraint on the matter. Isn't I think. it the other owners? Don't the other owners have to approve it? Yes, yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, the the, the club of other owners. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So that 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 condition has to be met, but I I don't think it's the big constraint. Um, uh, you you have. Uh, uh, these these teams are toys, as you suggest, uh, for these owners, and uh, uh, they you know they 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 don't they don't want to sell them at 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 what would be market value. So um, uh, I, I think that's a that's a uh, a uh, a feature that retards competition in a serious way because 
uh, if you have someone say Bidwell or I think maybe now Al Davis yeah. <laughs> uh, at the Raiders who who seems to use the club as a vehicle for launching suits mm-hmm. rather than rather than trying to compete for championships these days. Uh, uh, you know, since since they're in the group of teams and there's restricted entry, they can stay there. Whereas if you used the team for some other purpose other than winning in a competitive environment, then uh, another team would come up and replace you because you'd fall through the trap door. And of course, you know, that's the way some systems work uh, in other leagues around the world. But uh, we have a quasi-monopoly system set up in uh, in the states, and uh, that uh, that can perpetuate, um, you know, I you know, errors in management, if you will, uh, if if the teams again. Have a have an objective, which is something other than than winning ball games. And you know, I think uh, uh, you know, I mentioned Davis as a, an example. He does seem to be more concerned with winning lawsuits than winning games uh, in the past decade or so. And uh, you have owners that seem more interested in getting the best stadium subsidy from the taxpayer than uh, than uh, than winning uh, games on the court or games on the field. So. Uh, those those strategies can uh, can have uh, an influence, I think, on the workings of the labor market. And we talked about those issues in an earlier podcast that we'll put a link up to uh, on the site. Right. But I want to I want to challenge your um, logic on the club's approval. Yeah. If if Al Davis does a horrible job. Yeah. And embarrasses the league. Yeah. They'd love to they'll force him out. Yeah. But let's say he just does sort of like a really mediocre job, like. Three and thirteen, four and four and twelve, year in year out, six yep. and six and ten. Yep. Don't the owners kind of like that? I mean, why? <laughs> why would as long as it doesn't degrade the quality of the league itself, you actually don't want to approve a more aggressive toy owner who might outbid Al Davis or or bid well, right? It's such a strange model of an industry. Yep. Again, it, you know, it's it's sort of like. Uh, Toyota voting on whether Honda can replace its chairman. I, right. the, the, the motives there are a little bit, a little bit mixed. Yeah. The incentives, excuse me, the incentives are mixed. I think you're right. They are mixed. Uh, you, you, you like an easy game uh, for yourself, but uh, but when the uh, the other teams are facing that that club, you, you want to be at full strength and, sure. <laughs> and play it hard. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think the motives are mixed there and. Uh, but you know, from from one standpoint, if if everybody's just uh, sleepy and doesn't care, then then that'll keep the bidding for talent uh, right. suppressed. And I think everyone or every club owner certainly uh, would would appreciate that. But if it's too sleepy, franchises. But if it's too sleepy, yeah. the league's boring. Yeah. And then attendance falls across the league, and yep. everybody's punished. So there's this weird tension in in these yep. sports leagues. Between competition and, and and protecting a monopoly, it's a bizarre. Yeah. Oh, there certainly is. Yeah. Now you, we talked earlier about your work. Let's return back to the Oakland A's. Yeah. Uh, and and your findings uh, with with John Hakes on the return to on base percentage and how that return has dissipated has been uh, eliminated through competition. Yeah. Some people didn't agree with that uh, finding. What's been some of the critiques of that uh, of your research? Well, the uh, you know the, the most prominent uh, critic of the Moneyball uh, hypothesis in general was Steve Levitt, and uh, his criticism wasn't directed so much at our paper, but at the, the thesis in the book itself. And uh, What was Levitt's claim? Levitt's uh, claim is, is based on the facts, and that if you, you look at the A's in terms of offensive productivity, they look very much like the average, or, or like a decent team, but not like a, a, a dominant team. Whereas if you look at their Measures of pitching skill, then they're 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 excellent. They they had an excellent pitching staff uh, during this period, and he uses that to suggest that the uh, the uh, emphasis in Moneyball was misplaced, and that there really isn't much of a story there. The A's uh, did very well because they had great pitchers. And what's your response to that? Do you think that's right? Oh uh, well, as a, as a statement of fact, I think it it is right. Uh, does it refute uh, Lewis's? claim I don't think so I think we took the more uh, scientific route to refuting uh, Lewis's claim we evaluated the data on the claim itself and um, and what what the data 
data show is that uh, uh, certain elements of offensive skill were underpriced, and they happen to be elements of offensive skill that the A's concentrated on. That is, getting uh, on base through uh, through walks. So if you look at that aspect of offensive productivity, the A's are at the top of the distribution, and they got there quite cheaply, uh, which is the other part of, of the money ball uh, hypothesis. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the book doesn't focus uh, so much on the pitching skills that the A's had, which they did have in abundance, as, as Levitt points out, uh, but, uh, you know, the book focused on, you know, the more interesting aspects of the A's success, and that is their, their ability to cheaply purchase important uh, components of offensive productivity in a market that may have been askew. And it's an interesting point we didn't talk about directly, but year in, year out over the period we're talking about, which is the late 90s through the mid-2000s, the A's consistently lost free agents to other teams who outbid right. them. Right. Jason Giambi, right. Miguel Tejada. Uh, they traded Mulder, but uh, they lost Kent, uh, Keith Folk. Both pitchers and batters that the right. A's n- nurtured were, yeah. were lost, and they replaced yeah. them relatively easily with much cheaper alternatives. They didn't right. replace them perfectly. They right. didn't find somebody as good as Jason Giambi because they couldn't afford to. They'd love to have found someone as good as Giambi right. who's got a high on base and high slogging. Right. Right. Um, oh, he, well, he's, he's obviously an incredible talent, and uh, uh, they, they, as you say, they did, they, did a, they did a marvelous job of reformulating their team year after year. And uh, you know, once their guys came good, they couldn't afford them, so they they were, tried to reproduce them, and they did a pretty good job of that. And and they didn't always do it on a player for player basis. They often said, okay, well, we're losing this first baseman, but what with uh, 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 a substantial uh, uh, but not huge upgrade in right field and a little bit of addition over here at third base, then um, we can uh, make up for the gap that we're losing at first base and losing offensive production from Giambi. So uh, they they uh, had, a, had a very creative way of reforming their roster in response to these big, big uh, uh, stars leaving them. That's your earlier point, which I think is a really good one. They they took a what you might call a more holistic approach. They didn't yeah. say we have to have the best first baseman, the best second baseman. They understood that yeah. overall offensive ability came from all all the players, and you right. could make up a little bit here and there. Right, right. And you know, in, 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 if you avoid the syndrome of overpaying for the best by you know getting small increments at the at the seventh best person or potentially the eighth best person, uh, then. Um, uh, with increments in productivity there, where uh, you know there might be not be big differences within a position in the league. Well, you know maybe maybe you can uh, produce the same output more cheaply. I think that's that that was what they tried to do very explicitly, uh, and it's described uh, uh, in, a, in a beautiful way uh, in, in the book. But uh, you know what, what I find really interesting about the book is. How it brings out the doubting Thomas in people. It, it brought it out in me. Sure. Uh, but I found it compelling enough to, you know, go out and put together a data set and test it. Right. I went, but uh, you, know, you know, I don't want, want to criticize Steve Levitt too much, but you know, he he did what a lot of other people did, including me, which was express some skepticism. But uh, uh, you know, the. the you know the magnitude of the claim and the, uh, I guess the big impact it had in in the book market it brings about a a skeptical reaction. You know not just from uh, baseball people who feel challenged that hey you know they're saying we do it all wrong, uh, but also from economists who say hmm this is not necessarily consistent with our way of thinking about labor markets. Yeah, it's a um, it's like many beliefs. I don't, this isn't so much true of the economists, but of the fans and and some of the con- commentators on baseball who've reacted very negatively to, to Michael Lewis's book. It struck sort of at a religious um, level. People just thought oh, that can't be true. Right. My team's, you know, my general manager, my manager, my owners, a good. They're trying hard. They're doing the best yeah. they can. Yeah. They would never make these kind of mistakes. Right. And. Um, 
proof's in the pudding. Um, well, your, something was going on. <laughs> yeah, your paper is an obvious um, example, but even if you can't uh, understand multivariate statistical analysis, you can look at the standings. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, you look at you look at the standings in terms of wins, and then you look at the standings in terms of payroll, and they're inverted with Sometimes. with the case of the A's for quite some time. And you say, hmm, there's probably it's, it's probably more than just luck that's going on here. But you're suggesting that the A's are going to struggle to retain that edge. Right? I think so. That'd be a parallel um, implication. I think so. You know, you know, unless. They have a comparative advantage in unearthing new strategies. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty clear that they they did uh, take uh, you know some sabermetric work done by Bill James and other people and say, hmm, this seems to make sense. Let's go ahead and see if we can uh, build a strategy around it. And they implemented it, did it beautifully, won a lot of games. Uh, but everyone knows that that problem now. So, you know, unless it's the case that you know there's some other objective, and that that uh, that on-base percentage is going to continue to be or return to be overlooked uh, as a result of teams pursuing some other objective, you know that that uh, trick's not going to work anymore. Well, there are two other aspects of baseball. There's there's pitching and fielding and both yep. of those are also I believe grossly misunderstood by the casual fan and yep. perhaps by some general managers. Yep. I know that there's been an increased focus on trying to measure sophisticated yep. measures of, of both of those. I don't right. know if they're very successful. Right. I you know, it fielding's an important part of the game, but uh I think Bill James um uh had a had a uh, split of productivity between pitching, hitting, and fielding, in which it was well, it's fifty percent defense, fifty percent offense, just because you've got an offensive side and a defensive side. You mean and it's not ninety percent? It's huh? not ninety percent pitching. <laughs> <laughs> right, and ninety percent pitching. I love the rest that. Is, yeah, right. And it's fifty percent batting for a total of one forty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Who was it that said that? I don't know. It might have been Yogi Berra. It should have been. Um, I've got that quote in one of my papers somewhere. Okay, we'll find it. Put yeah. it up. Um, but uh, uh, so what? What James did was he split it uh, and said, "Okay, well, half of it's defense, and of the defensive side, well, about let's let's call it two thirds pitching, one third fielding. So that leaves you with about you know a little over fifteen percent of the game uh, comes from variation in fielding skill and." Uh, uh, Hakes and I actually have a paper in which we put that claim to the test, and um, you know we we can't do it with fielding directly, but uh, you know we could do it with pitching, and it it, it turns out that uh, his his uh, sort of ad hoc waiting scheme and giving about uh, you know a third of the game to pitching skill is right. I mean, it, it lines up with the data in a very interesting way. Well, Bill we had, James was an undergraduate economics major, so it's with, with a good intuition, I think. Yeah, I know he definitely does. I'm curious how you let's talk about that for a sec. How did you measure measure pitching? Because pitching, well, we two, did it. Go ahead. We did it on an ex ante basis, um, and so what what we did was we examined the impact that different starting pitchers had on the probability of winning a game holding other aspects of the team constant as reflected in betting market odds. Okay? And that tells us for each pitcher, so if you, you put in Roger Clemens uh, instead of Andy Pettit for the Houston Astros, what's the effect in the betting market of that move uh, on the Astros winning the game? And, uh, you know, Pettit's uh, pretty good. Uh, but Clemens is you know, one, one of the top ones. And your best pitchers have uh, an impact of about uh, 0.15 to 0.0225 or so. Uh, it's, it's a very long tail out there for those guys. But that's the impact that these pitchers have on the probability of their team winning a game, holding the ability of their team constant, and so on and so forth. So that is a measure 
of uh, of pitcher productivity, if you will. And then if you look at the um, the contribution of pitchers to winning games uh, is in a terms of a probability based weighting approach to every play that occurs in a game, and you weight uh, that probability by James's hypothesized contribution, the two measures, the probability-based measure from the betting market and the probability-based measure from performance and the actual plays that take place line up perfectly. Hmm. So, Beautiful. Uh, you know, that's a sort of an indirect test of, of Bill James' waiting scheme for uh, uh, how much pitching offense and defense matters in the game. And the efficiency of the betting market. And Yeah, it's a joint test. If you think the betting market is, is foolish, then you don't have a good test of, uh, of uh, Bill James' conjecture. Well, but we... if, you think the, if you think the betting market is not composed of fools, as I do, then you've got, a, you've got a pretty good test of James' conjecture there. I hope we can come back and talk about that betting market another time, but I want to stick with the, with the pitching for a sec. Yeah. I'm curious if you've looked at any of these um, newfangled uh, attempts to evaluate pitching. Some have argued that basically a ball that gets into play is a random event. Uh, yeah. You know, there are a lot of singles that are yeah. seeing eye grounders, right. and uh, there are a lot of credible line shots that are caught. And yeah. so the only the pitchers only really control three things. Home runs, walks, and yeah. strikeouts. Everything else is just random and right. from year to year can't be relied on. Right. Do, you think, do you think that – and the, the person who's came up with this theory is uh, Voris McCracken, Boris I think. Voris McCracken, yeah. Do, what do you think of that? Have That's you looked a good at that at all? Appro- it's a good first approximation. Yeah. It's a very good first approximation. Um, pe- people have gone over this um, with a fine-tooth comb, and I haven't. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the, the consensus is that – Pitchers, pitcher abilities do matter somewhat for balls in play, but most of it is most of that ability is picked up by the uh, pitcher ability independent of balls in play. So the the strikeouts, the walks, the home runs, and so on. So that if if someone scores very good on that measure, then the ability of his team to convert balls in play into outs is picked up by that measure. So and 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 that's a small uh slice of it i think the the biggest slice of it is you know a pitcher's ability uh to uh to get people out independent of relying on his defense well i look forward to the day when usa today lists uh strikeout to walk ratio leaders um right in its, in its sports section right yeah i think you know they they're they're a little bit behind in in terms of presenting uh pitching statistics that's clear era is a is a cloudy measure of pitching it is. skill. Every, everyone, everyone agrees on that, I think. The, and, at least the people who've looked at it in the statistics community. And winning percentage is a cloudy statistic, and yet for Cy Young Awards, it's heavily weighted, I think. Right. Just a pr- or number of wins, which is right. a bizarre, right. strange thing. Well, I, you know, these Cy Young Awards and MVPs and, you know, Heisman Trophies are beauty contests. I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I think there's always going to be an element of that in those awards. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah, true. It'd be nice to 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 uh, allocate the award based on a pure measure of skill and performance over over the year, but uh, that, that may be asking too much. Yeah, it'd be like asking uh, America's newspapers to report details on fringe benefits when they're talking about compensation instead of just right. focusing on wages, which right. they seem to do uh, exactly yeah. all the time. My guest today has been Skip Sauer professor of economics and the chair of the Walker Department of Economics at Clemson University. To comment on this conversation, find other episodes of EconTalk or links related to today's conversation, go to econtalk.org. And now let's turn to a couple of listener emails. John Shonder writes about the podcast with Larry Yannacone. I enjoyed your recent interview with Larry Yannacone on the economics of religion. There is a question I would like to ask. The theory that state-sponsored religions should have the weakest adherence applies well to countries like Sweden and the United Kingdom. But what about places like Iran and Saudi Arabia? I'm sure it's difficult to obtain survey data from these countries and probably impossible to get people to respond honestly on religious topics. But economic theory would predict low levels of attendance at mosques, high levels of cynicism about religion, etc. Does Professor Yannakoni think this is the case contrary to outward appearances? 
Thanks, John. That's an excellent question. John's reacting to a discussion in the podcast where Larry talked about how state monopolies on religion in Western Europe led to a situation where the church was too much like the Department of Motor Vehicles, poor service, a lack of religiosity, and a bad consumer experience all around. In contrast to the United States, where religion is not a monopoly of the state, there's lots of competition, and as a result, we find lots more uh, church attendance and religiosity. So I asked Larry how the Islamic world was able to create high levels of religiosity despite the state monopoly over religion. He gave uh, quite an interesting answer, had a number of parts. Part of Larry's answer is that what we think of as a monolithic monopoly in a place like Saudi Arabia is in fact more competitive than it might appear from the outside. Larry says that anyone can put out a shingle and become a true teacher in Islam. It doesn't guarantee a following. Anyone can call themselves an imam, but they have to compete with each other. And of course, different sects have to compete with each other for adherence. He gave the example of school choice. If all schooling is private, then there's lots of competition in contrast to the public state monopoly. But just allowing school choice among public schools, allowing students to choose among public schools, would induce some competition along with some of the benefits we would normally expect from a more competitive market. In the northern European state churches, Larry points out, in contrast with Islam in the Arab world, the church was a monolithic government monopoly and the clergy were civil servants. They were put in, into uh, legal structures. Larry had more to say than that, but I'd like to save that for a future podcast when he can talk about it himself. The second letter we received this week from Jacob Tuma was as follows. I really enjoy Econ Talk. When I first started listening, I feared there'd be a limited number of topics, but you've demonstrated that economics applies to every aspect of our lives. Who would have thought economics and parenting? I was very interested in the episode entitled Private versus Public Risk-Taking with Professor Munger. In this episode, you briefly talked about how government requirements for safety features don't lower the amount of risk people are willing to take. Because the level of risk doesn't go down, but the safety of the car goes up, people may be more willing to drive recklessly. Are there other examples of this? This type of unintended consequence isn't understood by many people, and I'd like to have more examples to use in conversation. Well, it's a very good point, Jacob. I uh, appreciate your appreciation of the diversity of topics on Econ Talk, and we will have uh, Don Cox on soon to talk again about biology and economics. You referred to his podcast with economics and parenting. But turning to the podcast with Michael Munger on private versus public risk-taking, you're referring to an example where uh, Mike and I were talking about how government regulation to make cars safer, such as airbags or uh, anti-lock requiring some kind of braking system, or mandatory seat belts uh, makes the car safer, but that in turn encourages people to drive more recklessly and can lead to more accidents and potentially more fatalities than in a world where uh, without those regulations. And empirically, that's what economists have found. They have found that in cases where cars have been made arbitrarily safer by government regulation, people did respond by driving more recklessly. The number of accidents did increase. The net effect on mortality is unclear. Empirically, it's found that uh, some, some studies, Sam Peltzman's, for example, has found that pedestrians were harmed as a result of the more reckless driving of, of, uh, of drivers who were feeling safer. So it's a very interesting example. You asked for some different examples. I would, I'm going to give two. One is a, a study of licensing. Uh, Carol and Gaston, two economists, studied the effect of licensing restrictions. They found that when licensing was more restrictive for electricians, there were fewer electricians but more accidental deaths as a result of the licensing. So the idea of the licensing was to protect people from inadequately prepared or inadequately trained electricians. But as a result of the licensing, at least that was the claim, but as a result of the licensing, uh, electricians got became more expensive and people did presumably more repairs on their own, which were more dangerous, and there were more accidental deaths, controlling for other factors that might have affected that. Very depressing and chilling uh, example of the perverse effect of unintended consequences. Another example I would give, perhaps more depressing, 
is the FDA approval for pharmaceuticals. Uh, the FDA is supported by many Americans as an important defense against dangerous drugs. Of course, all drugs are dangerous. All drugs have side effects. The effect of FDA regulation is to raise the cost of innovation in the drug market. It's to raise the cost of bringing a new innovative drug to the marketplace. So as a result, drugs have fewer side effects than they otherwise would have, but fewer drugs are produced because the costs of innovation are higher. And again, economists who have studied this have found that the net effect is uh, unfortunately and tragically very deadly. We, we, uh, we don't see the lives that are lost due to over-regulation of the pharmaceutical industry. We're relieved that, it's, that, our, that our drugs are very safe, but there's a hidden cost as people are not given access to uh, the drugs for a long time while they're awaiting approval, and other drugs are not uh, created because of the costs of innovation are, being, are very high. I want to thank John Chandra and Jacob Tuma for kicking off this new feature of Econ Talk. I'd like to hear from you. Please send your comments and questions to Roberts, my last name, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, at gmu.edu.